starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, good afternoon. Today is Friday, August the 27th. I'm Donna Will, Professional Development Coordinator for the Developmental Disabilities Administration. We welcome you to the monthly webinars with Deputy Secretary Bernie Simons. Our presenters for today are Tamika Brown, Infection Preventionist, Nurse Consultant from the Infectious Disease Epidemiology and Outbreak Response Bureau of MDH, and also Rebecca Becky Perlmutter, Healthcare Associated Infections HAI Coordinator, uh, and she is also with um, Infectious Disease Epidemiology and Outbreak Response Bureau in the H. So before we begin, I'd like to go over a few things about the webinar. All participants are in listen-only mode. There are two options to hear the webinar by computer and phone. And if you look at the panel interface on your right labeled audio, you can click either computer or phone to switch for the best option. We have a handout in the handout section that you can also see in the panel. And we are recording the webinar and posting it on YouTube and also on the DDA website. Uh, any questions can be typed in the chat box in the webinar panel, and we will get to those towards the end of the presentation. So now I'd like to introduce Bernie Diamonds. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, and I, I welcome everybody uh, here to the webinar and our two uh, panelists from uh, the department. Um, I appreciate your time and uh, being to uh, engage and have discussion with the uh, a DDA community who's uh, attending this webinar. So again, I want to thank everybody for the support. You've been attending these webinars. We've been doing these for like 18 months now. Um, you've been doing a great job with keeping people safe and getting people vaccinated and running clinics. And, you know, I applaud the families and individuals and supports. It hasn't been easy. Um, there's been, uh, I think, some opportunities that People have experienced around uh, uh, assistive technology, et cetera, that uh, maybe uh, would not have uh, afforded itself that uh, opportunities. But, um, you know, again, um, I think everybody in the DD world of Maryland here has done an outstanding job. Uh, and again, I, I really, really applaud you and, and thank you for being uh, as, as diligent um, in, you know, Early on, before vaccinations, washing hands, wearing masks, social distancing, et cetera. And I also want to again thank Tamika Brown and Rebecca Promutter uh, from our uh, department's infectious disease and epidemiology uh, response uh, program. So, um, next slide, Donna. Okay, so obviously our highest priority is everybody's health and safety and well-being. I mean, we've talked about uh, that at, on every webinar when we were doing them weekly and then every other week and now monthly. And we want to make sure that uh, DDA is committed to transparency and dealing with all stakeholders and that uh, we're all working with the same information, uh, which is extremely important. And if something isn't clear, please uh, ask. And, uh, you know, sometimes when somebody's presenting or having a discussion, you think it's clear and it may not be as clear to the person who's who's listening at that point in time. I know I've experienced that. And I know other people have. So, again, uh, this the support that you've given to all of us has been wonderful and especially to each other and doing your social distancing and and uh, everything else that's uh, happened. Uh, throughout this pandemic, and hopefully at some point we we uh, see as uh, we know that our numbers are good uh, in the state with the number of people who have been uh, vaccinated. So uh, we'll continue to move forward uh, with that. And so uh, next slide, Donna. So, um, you know, we've got the uh, world still going on around us. And uh, as you can see, the Department of Disabilities and uh, the DD administration here uh, will be joining others throughout the United States in, in um, celebrating the, the great work that's done by our direct support professionals. And that's from September 12th to the 18th. 
and uh, there will be a recognition that week. And, you know, if you can help us by nominating uh, who you think is uh, or deserving and outstanding DSPs for that recognition, recognition um, you know, your nominee will be recognized during the month of uh, September, but not necessarily just during that week of the 12th through the 18th. And, and as you can see on the bottom of uh, this slide, there is a download for the uh, nomination forms. Next slide. So, uh, again, I want to say thank you to everybody. I mean, this is great leadership you've been doing. You've been very diligent. I can't say it enough for uh, seeing people vaccinated. Um, you know, the number of cl clinics that were held, uh, it just outstanding, truly outstanding. And so I want to give you some updates like we've been doing from uh, webinar to webinar. And uh, as of yesterday, the 26th, um, and this will be the confirmed cases for individuals that we who are participants in our waivers and, and state funded that we provide supports for. So uh, Central Region has 911 confirmed uh, cases and 56 people have passed away. East Region has got 153. Uh, confirmed positive and six people have passed away. The South region has got 636 people who are positive and 26 people have passed away. And in the West region, there's 377 confirmed positive cases and seven people have passed away. Um, when we look at our staffing uh, by region, um, the South region has 425 uh, staff who have tested positive and five people have passed away. Uh, the West region is 216 positive and two people passed away. Uh, the East region is 249 a positive and one person has passed away. And in the Central region, there is 720 uh, people who have tested positive, staff who have tested positive, and two people have passed away. So <clears throat> when we look at this slide, uh, we can see that, um, you know, this is uh, the week ending uh, the 25th, two days ago. And as you can see, the pie chart on the left basically talks about the total number of participants that we have in uh, 17764, uh, of which there is uh, 2,182 people who have uh, tested uh, positive. And you can see in the chart on uh, the right hand side, uh, the numbers that have uh, increased uh, from the, that time period. And so, um, and, and uh, you know, it wrote the drills down from our last uh, one, when you look at this uh, total of uh, 15 to one in five, and as you can see, we are noticing um, a slight increase with the Delta variant uh, across the region from what we're hearing from uh, our participants and our providers. So next slide. So uh, the chart on the left is from June 24th until uh, August 25th. And you can see we had no participants uh, that passed away uh, over that uh, couple of month interval. Uh, and we've had uh, the pie chart on the right shows that we've had 105 people who have passed away during uh, this whole pandemic uh, and, and the number, total number of people who have tested uh, a positive. So next slide. And so obviously we look at people because we get uh, reports directly from uh, the providers through the regional offices, but we also uh, want to be able to track the uh, 1600 people who are um, self-directing the services. And this slide shows uh, where we are and, uh, and there's been no increase that we've uh, been alerted to, um, and we usually would be, uh, and since that's how we know we had uh, 38 positive cases and we've had no deaths. So, um, you know, it's been a, a good job that people have, have done who are self-directing uh, their services. Next slide. So of our 17,000 plus people, um, you know, we've got about 13,641. So that's uh, pushing 80%, 79%, which is a great job. Um, and uh, we can see that uh, we've got 21% that have not received vaccines. But again, we haven't heard back from uh, all the agencies. Um, 
<clears throat> and again, I want to congratulate uh, all of the uh, individuals who have either gone out directly to uh, the pharmacy or the providers who have uh, worked and uh, with the pharmacies and uh, local health departments, et cetera, and, and obviously having 137 clinics. And not just for the people who you provide supports to in your agency, but I know you've reached out to uh, other people who are either self-directing or people who are uh, just at home with mom and dad and we're not necessarily part of your agency, but could be living in, in that local area. Next slide. So this is what we look like for uh, our vaccination tracking. Um, we can see that we've got uh, pushing uh, 1,500 family members, and that was an increase from the last time of uh, 115. Uh, administrative staff is an increase of uh, 88. Uh, direct support professionals is an increase of 313. And we've had one individual who is uh, participating in self-direction that uh, has been vaccinated. So that's a, a total of 517 since our last webinar. So, you know, I think that's good. We're, we're moving right along. And uh, basically I encourage everyone to continue to get your vaccinations. You know, this discussion about boosters, we'll see uh, when a little more information comes out uh, with that. We know that uh, it's been in the paper and the governor's talked about he got his booster. And so obviously we need to continue to uh, move forward with being vaccinated. And and again, you know, even though you're vaccinated, you know, we see uh, where people have been vaccinated and there's been breakthroughs. And so we still need to be, I think, vigilant about, you know, masking and washing hands, uh, et cetera, et cetera, because I don't think you can ever be uh, too careful and we really don't want anybody to uh, test positive and, and become ill. Uh, with that, I'm gonna introduce uh, Tamika uh, Brown and uh, Rebecca Becky Perlmutter, who are with us today from the department, uh, who deal with infection control, epidemiology and outbreak and you know, uh, she's, they're going to give you an update on COVID and the Delta variant. And uh, at the end of the presentation, they'll be able to take your questions. So with that, uh, thank you, uh, Tamika and Becky, for being here with us today. Thank you so much. And thank you very much for having me. This is Becky Perlmutter, and I'm with the Infectious Disease Outbreak Response Bureau. And I would like to add a couple of uh, thanks and congratulations. That's an incredibly good vaccination rate um, for your 82% uh, there. And um, wow, that's that's pretty pretty well done. Um, and uh, so, um, and that was actually a really fascinating look at the numbers. And I really appreciated that. All right, so we're going to dive in and um, have a look at the current COVID-19 situation. I'm looking at some numbers and why we're uh, having a little refresher right now. Discuss what Delta actually is, what it means, and then have a little review of some of the infection control basics that I know that Dr. Fetter has probably gone over more than once. Um, but because uh, if you're not using it every day, um, I tend to forget some of these things. So um, I think it's always a good thing to have a review because uh, despite vaccination, we also want to continue to be safe in all the other ways too. Next slide. All right, so this is the chart that I pulled off the CDC's num um, website this morning. Um, as you can see, the number of cases in the United States is definitely quite high at the moment. Um, you could think maybe we're starting to level off, maybe we're gonna start to plateau uh, soon, and hopefully that will also mean we'll turn a corner and start to go down, but uh, we will just have to wait and see what's going to happen there. Um, but there is definitely a, a significant uptick of uh, COVID-19 disease in the uh, country right now. Next slide. And that's also true here in Maryland. Um, today we reported 1,373 new cases in the past 24 hours, um, which I think is the highest that we've been since about April. Um, and uh, actually probably May, but so it's been several months since we've had numbers that high. Um, we're also tracking the number of um, new positive cases uh, who were not fully vaccinated. Uh, so 73% um, of our new cases were not fully vaccinated, which means that 26-27% um, were vaccinated. Um, so 
it's definitely something to keep in mind that vaccination is a, a really wonderful tool, but it is not the only tool in the box. And um, we have to remember that just because we have airbags, we still have to wear seat belts. Um, next slide. All right, so I also wanted to share, and this is again off of the website this morning, off of the CDC's website, and where we are in terms of Delta. So um, as you can see in the different colored bars here, um, we have some different, uh, you can call them flavors of COVID. Um, in the blue bar, you have the B117 or the alpha variant that came out of the UK. But you can also see that that was very quickly uh, outcompeted by the orange or the delta variant, B1617.2, um, which came out of India. And uh, in the past uh, week, um, delta B1617.2 made up 98.8% of all of the uh, COVID isolates that were sequenced in the United States. So that's an awful lot of delta variant. Next slide. So what are variants? Um, so generally, you're going to expect to see variants. Um, every time that virus reproduces, um, there could be mistakes in the genes. The um, virus might not be a completely perfect replica of itself. And every time there's a change in that uh, virus uh, DNA or RNA, it's going to potentially cause a variant. Um, and a lot of the time, that variant isn't even noticeable. It's not going to cause any changes in the how the virus acts. But every once in a while, you're going to get a variant that is going to cause something different. Um, so in this case, all of the COVID variants have very similar symptoms. And all of the tests that we have will detect whatever COVID-19 strain you have. Now, most of the tests that we have right now are not going to be able to tell you what strain you have. But as you could see on that previous chart at this point, pretty good bet that it's Delta. Um, so uh, sometimes you're going to have a variant that is going to really have an advantage. And this Delta variant really does appear to do that. It spreads much faster and um, it is much more infectious uh, than some of these other variants. And it might cause more severe uh, case of, cases of disease, might cause more death than some of the other variants as well. Um, it looks like vaccine coverage is pretty good for Delta, um, but perhaps not quite as good as it was for some of the other variants. But regardless of how um, effective it is for preventing actual cases of infection, um, the vaccine is still very, very good at preventing severe disease, hospitalization, and death, even with Delta. Um, and of course, there's always treatment available at this point with monoclonal antibodies, um, which is a whole lecture in and of itself that we're not really going to get into today. Um, but if you are interested, let us know. We can always talk about that. Next slide. All right, so what is Delta? Um, Delta is more contagious. Um, it is a variant that was first seen in India. Um, this was several months ago, and India um, saw a really dramatic and awful uh, spike in cases where they were seeing like 2 million new cases a day, um, and people were getting sick, and they were running out of um, hospital space and oxygen, and a lot of people suffered a great deal, and a lot of people died. And it was really awful. Um, and in part, that was because this variant is so much more infectious than the other one. Um, and it might cause more severe disease. So um, looking at the difference between Delta and Alpha, it looks like Delta probably is more likely to put people in the hospital um, and probably more likely to um, cause uh, severe disease and death. So um, it's a nasty little variant out there. And it's very easy to pass on. Next slide. Um, now, Vaccines are still highly effective against all of the COVID vac uh, viruses that we are aware of at this point, uh, including Delta. Um, now, no vaccine is 100% effective. Um, and every vaccine will have some people who will still get sick even though they're vaccinated. Um, and what's kind of funny is that the more people who get vaccinated, the more cases in vaccinated people you get. Like, for example, if 100% of your population is vaccinated, then any cases you see, 100% of your cases will also be in vaccinated people. So the more people who are vaccinated, the more cases of breakthrough that you're probably going to expect to see. Um, 
But even in those cases, when there is vaccine breakthrough, um, the vaccine is still very good at providing strong protection against serious illness and death. Um, as I mentioned, there are about 27% of the cases of COVID that are being detected right now are in fully vaccinated people, but they only make up like two or 3% of the hospitalized cases. So um, it's definitely helping keep pe people out of the hospital and it's definitely helping people um, not die. So uh, it is absolutely an, a very effective tool and I'm hoping it's going to help get us out of this pandemic one day. Next slide. All right, so I was gonna talk a little bit about community transmission because we don't live in a bubble. Um, and so I kind of wish we did sometimes, but whatever's happening out in your community is going to really make an impact on um, what's happening in your facilities, what's happening with your clients and your staff. So um, CDC looks at uh, transmission rates um, by judging it at the percent positivity of the um, PCR test and um, the total uh, rate of new cases per 100,000 people per, in the past seven days. And they've uh, classified things as low, moderate, substantial, and high transmission. And if you go to the next slide, um, unfortunately, at this point, there is an awful lot of orange and red on all of these maps. Um, so uh, I wanted to put this one up here as a Oh, I didn't even update this map. I am so sorry. I meant to update this map because right now it is just about all red um, and with a little bit of orange. But as you can see, uh, there was a, a fairly significant um, change from uh, July where the, everything was in the moderate range um, to uh, end of July, early August, uh, when things were all were uh, somewhere between moderate and substantial. And I have to say right now, this is um, all orange and red. So we're at um, high and substantial transmission here in Maryland. Next slide. Okay, so COVID is increasing in our community, which means that there's going to be more outbreaks in congregate settings, in schools, and in um, other settings where people might hang out together. So um, it's it all goes together. And since we all live in the same community, and um, we are all interacting with each other, more community transmission does tend to cause more outbreaks, um, especially in congregate living settings. So um, I know you've got a very wide variety of settings that you guys cover. Um, you can have um, like outpatient day programs, um, small group homes with one or two uh, clients and um, one or two staff. You can have larger settings. Um, and these are outbreaks and these, um, uh, situations are going to look very different depending on where you are, um, but a lot of the guidance is going to be very similar. Um, but because of this um, increase in COVID in the community, of course, the most effective strategy that we have is a vaccination among uh, congregate living uh, residents and among the uh, people who are caring for them. Next slide. All right, so. Um, People who are working in, living in, or visiting congregate care settings, uh, wherever that is, including nursing homes, assisted livings, group homes, um, should all make sure that people get vaccinated as soon as possible, which I know you're doing a fantastic job with. Um, wearing a mask, even if you're vaccinated. Um, if you feel ill, stay home. Um, I, if I had it, God, if I had a dollar every time someone said, it's just allergies, I'm gonna go to work. Gosh, I'd be really rich. Um, so when in doubt, get tested. Um, stay home if you don't feel well and get tested if you have any symptoms, even if you're pretty darn sure it's allergies, even if you think it's a sinus infection, um, because my goodness, they, the, this bug, it looks like everything. It's really hard to tell. Next slide. All right, so um, CDC has started to recommend that um, not only is vaccination crucial, um, but masking is going to continue to play a really important role in controlling COVID right now. So um, at this point in uh, communities where the transmission level is um, high to substantial, um, individuals should continue to wear masks indoors, regardless of their vaccination status. Um, 
Now this slide, I have to admit, I borrowed it from the CDC's uh, website and it talks about nursing homes, but most of this is going to really apply uh, to your settings as well in general congregate care settings. Um, is that staff should continue to wear masks around the residents. I know your population might struggle sometimes with mask use and when that happens, it's especially important for the staff to continue to wear a mask. Um, visitors should also continue to wear masks when they are uh, visiting the facility, um, when they're in common areas especially, but in general, um, making sure that they're also wearing a mask when uh, visiting privately with residents. Um, and residents should be encouraged to wear masks as well, um, whether they're outside their rooms in a community setting or if they're hanging out with their friends in the uh, common areas. Um, mask use is going to continue to be a really great tool. Um, staying at home if you feel ill. Uh, you know, this is really hard. This has been a huge culture shift in the United States, and I hope it stays, but I'm not entirely sure it will. Um, we have, and I've been just as guilty of this as anyone, uh, in the uh, category of, oh, it's just a cold, I'll go to work, and I'll just infect all of my coworkers with my cold, because it's just a cold. Um, I didn't quite realize until this pandemic how inappropriate it is for me to go to work while I'm not feeling well and infect my coworkers, even though it is just a cold. And they've infected me too, so it's it's all comes out in the wash. But um, yeah, trying to keep people who are sick home so that they don't transmit whatever they have, whether it's COVID or a cold or the flu or a tummy bug trying to keep people from transmitting their infectious diseases to other people. It's a great idea. I don't know why we didn't think of this sooner. Um, and then yes, making sure that when in doubt, if you have any doubt of your um, signs and symptoms, uh, get tested. Um, at this point, testing is quick. Uh, if you're symptomatic, it's covered by all sorts of insurance. Um, it's easy to get and you'll get your results very quickly and then you will have the peace of mind of knowing yes it really was just allergies or oh wow <laughs> COVID really feels like allergies so either way next slide all right so because this is a community issue and because you've got people who are going out into the community your staff your clients you've got visitors um, so when people are leaving the facilities uh, to go out into the facility, uh, into the um, general population, you might have residents or uh, clients who have jobs um, or who are going to go out and do their own uh, shopping and recreational activities. But when people are out of the facility, they should really make sure to wear a mask, um, especially indoors, uh, especially in areas with substantial or high transmission, which is really everywhere at this point. Um, Anyone who's not fully vaccinated and over the age of two should generally be masking indoors regardless. But um, at this point, um, everyone really should be masking um, indoors. And you know, if you're outdoors in a crowded setting, it still should probably consider wearing a mask, even if it's like an outdoor music festival sort of deal, uh, if you go to the baseball game, that sort of thing. Um, if there's a lot of people around, wear that mask. It's a minor pain considering how uh, nasty COVID can be. Next slide. All right. Um, so rather like the analogy, just because I have uh, airbags in my car, I am going to continue to wear my seatbelt. So just because I'm vaccinated, I'm also going to continue to take these basic infection control precautions. So um, we're going to walk through these, but uh, and you've probably heard of a lot of these before from Kenny, um, but uh, making sure that you're washing your hands, you're cleaning your stuff, you're keeping your distance from lots of people, wearing your mask, staying home and getting tested when you're sick, and then wearing appropriate personal protective equipment when it's necessary. Next slide. All right, I'm gonna stop here and uh, pass this off to Tamika Brown, our nurse consultant in infection control here at MDH, and she's going to uh, talk you through some of the uh, basic infection control practices that we're trying to encourage throughout the uh, pandemic. Mika? All right, thank you, Becky. Hi, everyone, can you hear me? Yes. 
All right. Okay. Thank you for having me. So I'm going to talk about hand hygiene and all the basic infection control precautions um, that is best practices. For hand hygiene, um, which refers to hand washing or using soap or water or um, alcohol-based hand sanitizer. Um, so unless your hands are visibly soiled, hand sanitizer is certainly preferred because it's um, easier to access, easier to do. Um, so in most um, situations, hand sanitizer is the preferred. Um, using hand sanitizer requires uh, rubbing your hands, covering all the surfaces, especially between your fingers, which most times people miss. Um, make sure you cover your wrist as well, and you have to wait until your hands are dry. Um, and this should take about 20 seconds. Um, if you're doing hand washing, you wanna make sure you wet your hands and lather with soap, covering all surfaces and scrub. Friction is very um, key um, with hand washing, and that must be done at least 20 seconds. And you want to rinse and dry your hands, but be sure to turn off the faucet that you're using a paper towel, not to recontaminate your hands. Next slide, please. So when do you wash your hands or use hand sanitizer? So uh, for soap and um, um, water hand washing, definitely when your hands are visibly soiled, after using the restroom, before you eat, or after visiting someone who has C. diff or norovirus. So anything that has to do with uh, loose stools or diarrhea, you definitely wanna make sure that you're doing hand washing sanitizer is not gonna be affected. And using hand sanitizer, um, you use it before you enter a facility, a home, before entering a, a room of a resident or a patient, after touching the environment in a resident's room because that's considered contaminated surfaces as well. Um, after you leave the room, you want to do hand sanitizing. And if you must adjust your mask for eye protection, be sure to do that before and after doing, um, doing the adjustments of your mask for eye protection to reduce any potential contamination to your face area when doing so. Next slide. And you want to do cleaning and disinfection, now, which is key to make sure that we are um, killing or any organisms um, on surfaces. Um, so make sure you wipe off your clipboard, your pen, uh, your reusable eye protection, your goggles or face shield. Make sure you're disinfecting that before leaving the facility or sooner if it's visibly soiled. Um, there's no need to wipe off like paper or cardboard or any type of porous surfaces, but instead good, good hand hygiene after handling these items is very important. Next slide, please. The social distancing, distancing, as we've all heard throughout this pandemic, stay at least six feet um, from others, um, whether you're indoors or outdoors. Um, remember, you know, what is key is that some people ha have COVID-19, but they don't have any symptoms. And so many times that's where we see a lot of increase in transmission because you just never know who have COVID-19. So it's very important that we're uh, keeping our social distance um, from one another, whether you're indoors or outdoors. Next slide. And masking is to protect you and to protect others um, for source control. So wear a, a mask while on the grounds of any healthcare facility or at a home. Do not remove your mask for taking pictures. I see that a lot. Um, to easily be heard or when speaking on a phone, try to keep on your mask at all times. And also cover your nose and mouth, not just your mouth and your nose is still outside the mask. That is not effective. You wanna make sure you're always covering your nose and mouth at all times. Next slide, please. And symptom screening. So in garden staff, um, make sure if you have any symptoms of COVID-19 or have a sick family member at home that you notify your supervisor and stay home. So as Becky just mentioned before, you don't wanna um, infect anyone else that you're working with or anyone that you're visiting, um, any one of your patients' residents that you're visiting. Um, in many facilities, there's an entry screening that asks particular questions about uh, um, COVID-19 symptoms prior to entry into the facility, um, but also before going out in your visits, um, making sure that you're also um, doing your self-assessment and ensuring that you don't have any symptoms that's related to COVID-19. Next slide, please. And so um, we have two we have two different types of precautions. We mention a lot. It's standard precautions and transmission-based precautions. And standard-based precautions is exactly what we've been talking about throughout this whole presentation. It's the basic core infection control prevention measures, hand hygiene, clean and disinfection, wearing your mask, 
um, for source control are the basics that should always be used. But in addition to standard precautions, we also have transmission-based precautions like contact or droplet um, um, isolation, uh, which we are using for um, to prevent for the spread of any specific illness. In this case, is COVID-19 in uh, healthcare facilities or homes, and so that requires additional personal protective equipment, which we'll talk some more about in the later slides. So anytime you're visiting a facility or group home and there's a sign that's posted, follow, follow those posted isolation signage um, and ask the staff member if there's any additional precautions that's needed before you enter, enter that room. And there goes uh, sample pictures of what some of the signage look like. Next slide, please. So what is personal protective equipment? It's the specialized clothing or equipment that we use to protect um, against infectious uh, materials. Next slide. So that would include, next slide please, gloves, uh, which protects our hands, um, gowns and aprons, uh, which we wear to protect our skin and our clothing, masks to protect our, our mouth and nose, respirators when, when there's um, any chance or risk for airborne uh, transmission of an infectious agent, uh, goggles help to protect your eyes, and face shield gives us a little bit extra protection, not just our eyes, but our face, mouth, and nose. So depending on the task that we're about to do um, as we get in close contact with many of our patients and residents, it determines the type of PPE that will be required, required to, to be used. At this time, we're doing a uh, mask and uh, face shield prior to entering a facility. And um, if there's any additional PPE that's needed, you'll follow the isolation signage on the door. Next slide, please. So let's talk about putting on uh, PPE. So yes, there's steps for that too. <laughs> so mask and eye protection, um, definitely like mentioned before, we wear that before we enter the facility, you wanna make sure that um, you have that on initially. Um, but if additional PPE is required, um, you wanna put that on in the hallway before you actually enter the room. And um, mask and face shield um, is the first thing which, will, which you will have on already before entering the facility. And the next uh, PPE that you will put on first will be your gown and then your gloves. When you put your gown on, you want to make sure that you are uh, completely tying the top part um, and the bottom and not leaving them untied where they could potentially fall off on your shoulders while you're in the room with the uh, resident. And your gloves, when you're putting, um, putting on your gloves, you want to make sure that it comes over the cuff um, for the uh, for the gown and that there's no uh, skin uh, showing uh, as much as possible. Next slide, please. So when taking off your PPE, think about it as uh, removing the most contaminated PPE. So that'll be your gloves because that's what we do a lot of touching of surfaces and of patients and residents. That'll be considered the most contaminated PPE. So you wanna remove that first and then your gown. Um, and you want to make sure um, that the gloves and gown is removed just inside the patient room and in a regular garbage can. So inside each room prior to exit, there should be a regular garbage bin where you can discard your gloves and gowns right before exiting. Uh, removing your mask and eye protection is only after leaving a facility unless it's soiled, wet, or damaged and needs to be changed. So if, if, it, uh, if so, you want to make sure that you do exit the room, make sure you're six feet away from others, um, before you switch out your eye protection or mask if needed. Uh, be sure to wash your hands uh, after removing and before putting on any new PPE. Next slide, please. And very important, avoid touching your PPE, especially the front of your mask or front of the face shield. It's potentially contaminated. But if you do, hand hygiene is... Um, is key. Make sure you're doing hand sanitizing um, before you touch any other parts of um, your PPEs um, or moving on with any additional tasks. But you definitely want to make sure that you're avoiding touching your PPE. Not sure people realize how much they put their hands to their faces. I'm sure now people are more aware. Next slide, please. All right, so what do I do if a client tests positive? Uh, so report suspected or positive cases um, of COVID-19 uh, staff or residents to your local health department and create a plan for testing um, all other residents and staff, um, especially those who are close contact. Um, 
and then encourage uh, your um, group home residents with COVID-19 symptoms and your roommates and close contacts to self-isolate and limit their use of sharing spaces. So you, um, you want to increase cleaning and disinfection um, of the home with approved disinfectants. And so there's a link in the slides. Um, so there's a disinfectant that they're using. You're able to check to see if it's approved and effective against COVID-19. And minimize the number of staff members who have face-to-face -face interactions with the residents who have suspected or uh, confirmed uh, COVID-19. And there's some guidance there for uh, group homes um, in the slides for additional information. Next slide. Uh, protecting staff and residents. So keep, keep staff at higher risk of severe illness from COVID-19, from close contact with residents who have suspected or confirmed COVID-19 if possible. Uh, exclude staff who have tested positive for COVID-19 until they can stop isolation. So referring to the guidance for discontinued isolation in that link. Unvaccinated staff who have been exposed um, to COVID-19 should be excluded for 14 days after the uh, exposure. All staff, regardless of the vaccination status, should be ex excluded if they're symptomatic. Um, and make sure you're screening your residents, workers, and your essential volunteers for signs and symptoms of COVID-19. Next slide, please. All right, is vaccination update. Um, it remains one of the most important tools, as uh, Becky has mentioned before, to prevent the spread of COVID-19. And it's recommended for all people over age 12. Um, it does include pregnant and lactating um, people, uh, the Pfizer COVID-19 vaccine, Comirnaty, um, received the full FDA approval um, on August 23rd, 2021. Um, so that's like, that's great news um, as we progress through the outbreak. That's certainly a major milestone. Next step, next slide, please. All right, so most people who uh, get mRNA vaccine need two doses. Uh, Individuals who are moderately to severely immunocompromised may need a third dose to mount an effective response. Um, but at this time, booster shots are not recommended in the general population um, right now. Um, but the FDA is currently discussing the need for booster dose. Um, Luma has it that it'll be recommended by September 20th, 2021 um, to be received eight months after the second dose. So more to come on that. Um, if a booster dose is received, um, if a booster dose received emergency use authorization from FDA, then the uh, advisory committee on the immunization practices, they will discuss the recommendations and administration. So more to come on um, additional information regarding booster dose doses. And that's the end of our presentation. And um, if you have any questions, um, if time permits, we'll answer any questions at this time. But also feel free to email us at mdh.ipcovid at maryland.com with any infection control questions. And one, someone from our team will get back to you. Becky and, and Tamika, thank you so much for coming in today. Um, and presenting uh, to our um, stakeholders and families and participants. Uh, really do appreciate it. I just wanted to make sure before we open up the questions, Donna, if you go to the next slide, just a reminder of our next webinar, which is going to be September 24th at 1. Um, and I know that when I was talking to Becky and we we're talking about some of the PPE, this is just a reminder because the more that you hear about it, it just reminds people the do's and don'ts with PPE. I know that we've had several um, presentations and information about the utilization, how to use it, but it's always good as a refresher and as a reminder. So thank you so much. Um, I'm going to start with the first question in this. Um, and this is for Becky or Tamika, and is uh, boosters are strictly for um, immune compromise or for all vaccinated? Do we know for whom? Um, right now, boosters are recommended for, um, actually, so here's the thing, and it's sort of like splitting hairs, but it's also very important. There's a difference between a third dose and a booster dose. So third doses are given out as part of an original series because um, without that extra dose, um, the person won't mount an effective immune response. So people who are severely immunocompromised um, are gonna probably need three doses to mount an effective response. And that would be part of their original vaccination series. Now boosters 
um, are something that you would give someone who's got the vaccine and their uh, immunization worked and they mounted a really good response, but then after enough time, then that response started to fade. And that's when you would need a booster. So um, there's two different things going on here. Right now, there are no boosters approved. Um, however, people who are severely or moderately immunocompromised are now being recommended to potentially get that third dose um, to complete their series. If you are moderately or severely immunocompromised and have not had any COVID vaccines, then um, of course you would have to start with dose one. Does that answer the question? Yeah, thank you. Um, and I have several others. So um, when you count uh, on new cases, are you including people in 10 day windows as injection? Um, so we define fully vaccinated as 14 days after receiving the second dose of a two dose series or after receiving one dose of a one dose series. Um, so if you're uh, in between there, you'd be partially vaccinated. And if you haven't had uh, the entire series, you'd be partially vaccinated. And if you haven't had any, it's unvaccinated. But if you're 14 days out, then it's fully vaccinated. Right. Um, and isn't the annual flu a different variant every year? Oh, yeah. That's why we keep getting flu shots. Uh, can you explain why uh, we're applying the same standards to settings where three people live as roommates? as we are a large congregate setting or did the, or can you explain why do they have to take if you have visitors and families and how would you support and in, in changing living in the community from being in a congress setting like a nursing home so part of that is because three people are important too um and well it's much harder um if you have one person out of three who gets COVID, you don't want the other two people to get COVID and you want to try to prevent that. Um, it's harder, the smaller the building is, the smaller the space is, um, but you still want to prevent it. Um, I was exposed not too terribly long ago. And uh, while I was waiting for all of my test results to come back, um, I basically stayed in my room and my roommate would bring me food and uh, she was very nice about the whole thing, but um, I just tried to avoid her as much as absolutely possible because just because we're at home doesn't mean I want to infect her. Um, so we're trying to treat everyone's home-like setting, whether that's um, three residents or 20 residents, um, as safe and trying to prevent one person who gets COVID from giving it to everyone else whether everyone else is two or 19 or any other number of people. Does that make sense? Yep, thank you, Becky. Um, and this one is about a question in the ER. A staff person was at the ER and they, te they tested her. They say that there are no longer any rapid tests because they are not accurate. Is this true? Oh, rapid tests. Um, they're, they're better than nothing. Um, and I think it depends a lot on the circumstances. Uh, if somebody is symptomatic, if somebody has signs and symptoms, then those rapid tests are usually pretty darn good. Um, if somebody is asymptomatic, if they're not sick and they get a rapid test, you know, if it's positive, it's probably positive. If you're, I'm sorry, I'm wrong. If it's negative, you're, no, I, I was right the first time. Um, if it's positive, you're probably positive. Um, but uh, if you're asymptomatic, that negative might not rule out having COVID. So it really depends on the circumstances. Um, and you can make up for that by testing a lot. Um, if, if you get tested every week or every, every couple of days, um, even if it's a rapid test, even if you're asymptomatic, eventually, if you're positive, it's going to come up positive. Um, but if, if it's a one-shot deal and you're asymptomatic, then it's probably better, probably, to get a PCR test, which is more accurate and more likely to give you a correct negative. Problem is, it takes an extra day or two. Thank you. Um, 
Do you know if Marylanders, um, if Maryland is officially rolling back to phase one protocol in light of the Delta variant? I wouldn't think so. Um, since the governor has not made any uh, indication of um, any sort of mask mandate or, uh, um, I guess, movement control or uh, recommending quarantine, I, I wouldn't think so. But I don't know. Thank you. Um, and this one is um, is a, um, a comment and an absence of clarity. It says support staff need to breathe clean air, not rebreathe carbon dioxide and bacteria trapped inside their mask. Why must a caregiver wear a mask their entire shift? Um, it seems that um, is there any clarity as to how often uh, should you change your mask and when should you replace it? Um, and should they have one if they're engaging directly hands on with a person? Yeah, so um, there have been a lot of studies about uh, the air that you breathe inside your mask. And um, there was actually one study that seemed to indicate that there was um, higher carbon dioxide or inside a mask. Um, and that actually got published and then it got retracted real fast because people realized that the methodology used in that study was um, both uh, poorly done and not replicatable. Nobody could get those same results again. So there is no evidence that wearing a mask increases carbon dioxide. And it's, there's no evidence that wearing a mask that you're going to change on a regular basis is going to increase um, any sorts of bacteria. So um, general recommendation is that, yes, you're going to wear a mask when you're indoors around other people. Um, every time you take that mask off, um, if, it's, if you're taking that mask off for a while, you're probably going to want to put a new one on, put a different one on. Um, we're not in any sort of mask shortages right now, the way we were at the beginning of this pandemic. So um, basically change your mask whenever it gets um, dirty, uh, if it gets soiled, if you've taken it off and shoved it in your pocket, Put a clean one on. Thank you, Becky. Um, the next one is um, previously we were told that we did not need to report positive test cases to the local health department. Is that accurate? And no, you absolutely. Sorry. No, sorry. You yes, you absolutely do need to report uh, positive tests to your local health department because, um, as per um, Maryland Code of Regulations. Uh, anyone who is aware of an outbreak is required to report it. And um, since the definition of COVID outbreaks is generally a very uh, low number, then yes, you are supposed to be reporting all of your uh, COVID cases in staff and in residents to uh, your local health department who will be able to help determine whether or not that's an outbreak. Thank you. And the second part of that question, do we continue to report positive case, uh, cases to DDA? And the answer is yes, please. Thank you. Um, Becky, the next one is please define close contact as we determine who to test when someone has been exposed to COVID. Sure. So um, the CDC's technical definition of close contact is being within six feet of somebody for 15 minutes or more in a 24 hour period. Now, it's not a yes or no question. It's not like if you were close to someone for 14 minutes, you're safe. And if it was 15, then, oh, you must be infected. No, it's a whole spectrum of things. So to some extent, I mean, that's, that's a good rule. But to some extent, use your best judgment. If there were a bunch of people in a small room with bad air circulation, you might want to test them all, even if they wouldn't have met that criteria specifically. So um, there's, the, there's the basic rule, and then there's the use your brain. And when in doubt, test. Okay, this is a test. If a person who has had part of the back series and they get COVID, are they re reported a, um, as unvaccinated? They're reported as partially vaccinated. Okay. Uh, does the concern with the rapid test apply to PCR rapid test? No, just antigen. I love those PCR rapid tests. I think it's a brilliant idea. Okay, then the next one is, um, there's been a lot of positive tests are coming from people that are vaccinated 
and we aren't doing weekly tests on them. It seems kind of crazy that we would be just testing unvaccinated. Um, should we be vaccinating everybody or are we testing everybody regardless of the vaccination status? Um, you know, I think it's a good idea. Honestly, at this point, I think that's not a bad policy to consider. Um, it is not currently part of the CDC guidance. It is not currently part of the Maryland guidance. So it is certainly not a requirement, but it's not a bad thing to think about. And during an outbreak, of course, um, you are supposed to be testing everyone vaccinated and unvaccinated. And this one is, um, I heard that you need to wait five days after exposure for a test to come back correctly. Is this correct? Um, kind of. So the incubation for period for um, COVID is between uh, about two and 14 days. Now, most people who get COVID are going to probably start to test positive between days four and five. That'll catch most people, but there are going to be people who will be negative on day 12 and positive on day 13. It's rare, but it can happen. So because of, and that's part of the reason that um, if you are testing out of 14 day quarantine early, that you absolutely have to wear a mask uh, when out in public because you cannot be sure you're not going to be that uh, day 13 converter. Okay, thank you. And this one says, can you explain why one positive in a group home is considered an outbreak. Yeah, if it's five in the program to consider an outbreak. Is, is it not considered an outbreak if it's five in the program? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I mean, I think the general uh, theory behind that is that um, in residential settings, you're much more likely to have been exposed within that residential setting. Um, now, granted, some of these rules came from like March and April of 2020. And um, if we were making these rules today, they might look different. But this is what we're dealing with. So um, I think if you're in a um, kind of an outpatient setting or a, a school or a daycare or uh, a medical daycare, um, then it's fairly well established that the people who are attending um, that daycare are going to have outside exposures from their families, from their living situations, from uh, any errands or um, recreational activities that they do. Um, but people who are in a congregate uh, living setting, who are living in a group home, um, are going to be uh, having similar exposures. Um, and if there is one case in a group home where a bunch of people are living together, um, the risk of ongoing transmission within that residential setting is a lot higher than in a um, an outpatient setting. Thank you. Um, this one is for those exposed to Delta variant. Do they quarantine more than fourteen days, or how no. long should? Same, same fourteen days. Right, and then who identifies as uh, immunocompromised? Uh, so CDC has a, a very uh, comprehensive list um, looking at what that means. Um, I think it's um, people with organ transplants, um, people who've had a, a bone marrow transplant in the past two years, people who are on um, chemotherapy for cancer, um, high dose steroids, oh gosh, uh, certain uh, primary immunity immunodeficiencies, and I would have to actually look at the CDC's website to make sure I was getting all of those. Um, but it's online. All right. Well, it's closer to our time. Um, if there's any additional questions, please um, type them in the chat box. And what we usually do is we'll share this with our speakers so they have an opportunity to look at your questions and provide feedback, and then we'll add it to our frequently asked questions. So um, um, thank you so very much. Um, and I'm gonna turn it over to Bernie. Well, I, <clears throat> again, I wanna thank everybody for uh, attending today. And I wanna especially thank uh, our two speakers. I think it was very informative. Um, thank you for taking the time for uh, being with us. Um, Again, I think it was extremely uh, informative to have uh, Tamika and Rebecca here and 
maybe uh, we can have you back in the future if uh, you know we get follow-up questions and uh, can make sure that you you're here to assist us so we, we appreciate your help and everybody be safe and have a great weekend thank you